ladies and gentlemen. Shh. It's spoken word night, so you gotta keep it down. We just had an excellent set by by Brian Rowe, his first ever spoken word performance. Let's give him another big hand. Okay, at 10.30 we got the Manus Brothers at, not, at uh, 10 o'clock Project Blue and at 9.30 Robert Priest, but right now we'd like you to put your hands together and give a warm sidewalk welcome to Mr. Peter Bezoza. Hi, good evening. Uh, it's spoken word night. I'm, I'm going to be talking about sacred ambivalence. My name is Peter Dezoza. I'm the man with three Z's. The first Z is for sleeping, the second is for composing, and the third Z is for music. I'm usually at the piano, and I'll be there off and on tonight, but tonight I face you head on. But I have the help. This paper actually is going to force me to say what I've written here. It is my pleasure and purpose this evening to delight and enlighten you with spoken word. I prepared a monologue called Sacred Ambivalence, and it goes like this. I I'm so depressed, I don't know what to do, Charlie Brown. Uh, I have all the knowledge in my mind to conquer the world, but I can't leave the house without my security blanket. I I'll try to outgrow it, but meanwhile it's my blanket and me. Together, we can do anything. And from my doghouse, I can fly over France. I, I was jumping rope the other day, and suddenly it all seemed so pointless. I'm thinking about those days when peanuts used to speak for all of us. I don't know, do they ever speak for you? Did you grow up with peanuts? I mean, I... Yeah! 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 yeah. Cause they, yeah. Was like, well, I remember there was the gospel according to peanuts. It was a very str strange period in the 60s, and uh, I, I related very much to them. In fact, uh, my parents pretty much approved, even though they were kind of... Uh, I mean, I was the same way. I was wishy-washy. I was kind of, uh, 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 well, very insecure, and uh, I think... Uh, that, that, uh, after a while I became, um, I, I began to speak their roles. I, I used to sing the songs that they have now put back on Broadway. You know, they're actually back there. They're, you're a good man. They're doing this new disco version of You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. And they, did anybody see? Yeah, it was down the block. No, I saw the Radio You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown? Was that? Well, you know it was on 8th Street, where the St. Mark Cinema was for many years, and now I think it's like a flamingo place. You can go over there and, and see flamingo dancing there. And you can go on to Broadway, and you can see um, Anthony Rapp and... Uh, did anybody see M. Butterfly? It's a very weird show now. There's a fellow named uh, B.D. Wong who's playing Linus. He's quite a you know, lovely fellow. The other um, character's kind of whiny. In fact, the whole thing, but, but it's funny actually when the, the fellow from Rent is now the lead Charlie Brown. I know John Berger should have played Charlie Brown. We have a fellow here. I, I guess he is. It was a very good point. Anyway, I'm um, interested in them because, well, now they're up on Broadway. They're doing their, um, their songs about uh, bemo they're, pe they're bemoaning a peanut existence and they're really, they're, they're, they're human beings themselves. They, they sing about um, they were my role models, and I fell under their influence when I was only 10, going back to what I've written. I, I was very uh, compulsive, wishy-washy, intended to procrastinate, so I went with that. Uh, the nice thing about Peanuts, from my point of view, is that they were speakers. They were people who would do um, even the talking cure. I think Lucy was offering them the talking cure in order to you know, get get them beyond whatever problems they had. This is distinguished from Marvel comics where they certainly were not action figures, right, John? At the time, they were, you know, con they, it was very conspicuously like there were these Superman genres of people who could do anything, and then there were these human beings, the, the kids who had these sort of relatable problems. I'm, I, I definitely went with, I mean, I could see Latch here as the action figure. You know, he went with the Superman. And I was going, I never really read those, the Marvel comics. The only thing they had in common was that they were both paneled graphics. The Peanut crew had more in common with, say, Archie and his friends, and they had a hell of a lot more character than this Richie Rich, these Harvey comics. I don't know if you remember, did you ever read um, R Richie Rich was kind of a philanthropist? And for some reason, I was, I was offended by, because I, I, I guess I wanted, I wanted his position, I related very much, but I, I felt I was, I was a victim of exploitation for some reason. I was, I, I was proud to love Peanuts, but I was very, I was sort of embarrassed to like 
the um, the Richie Rich song. So the, the Richie Rich comics, they also are famous for um, Casper and Wendy the Good Witch and Lotto and Dot. Hot stuff. It's kind of, what else do they have? Hot stuff? Oh yeah, that was a little devil character in the Casper. Group, wasn't it? Sort of, they had a mystical side, but then they had the ordinary group, Richie Rich, all he had was a tremendous amount of money, and father, mother. I would, um, what I remember about them was that I was sort of um, moved enough to write a song, which is what I'm going to play for you. It's called Dealing With My Friends, because Richie Rich, my sister remembers the song, I used to play it in the... Um, in, a, in a, a band in high school, I'm going to attempt to uh, recreate it at this time. It um, it talks about Richie and his relationship with his friends, and this would include this includes God as well. And it's uh, again, John Berger, I thank you very much. It, it's perfectly understandable from a Calvinist mentality that God would be Richie's friend. I mean, look at him; he's, he has everything. He's rich. He's, he's a, a friend of God's. Joey also has ways to get to how to become friends with God. In fact, the best advice for any of us is to how to get to heaven if you want to go to heaven to go drinking with God. Um, my idea, though, that God had other plans because it's never so simple. You know, all the good things lead to some some horrible denouement of some kind. So that was at the state I was at 15. The song is called Dealing With My Friends, and it features Richie Rich and his friends, and this includes God as well. And here I am not sleeping, I may be very small, but all this is mine for the keeping, you see I'm very important, of course. Go to sleep, my little 
one. Based zine featuring the masterwork of R. Crumb and S. Clay Wilson. I think Zap it pandered to the sexual arousal of pubescent boys who had already mastered the art of masturbation, just needed something to wank off about. I know, I know we all had Kama Sutra classes in high school, but I'm proud to say that masturbation is one of the few things I really figured out early in life. Woody Allen helped me feel a lot better about this by telling me that masturbation is actually sex with someone you love. It's beautiful. So, remember, you're no, thank you, Woody Allen, uh, you're nobody till somebody loves you, so you better find yourself somebody to love. And here's another, you always hurt the one you love, the one you shouldn't hurt at all. So if I broke your heart last night, dear, it's because I love you most of all. Oscar Wilde said, you always kill the one you love. I wish I'd said that. You will, Dorian, you will. I was such a subversive child that I could never muster concern about my future. Soon all I felt for the future was dread. There were judgments. It was like the future was... Here's the end of the future. So, I was such a... I'm, I'm, I can follow my own train of thought very easily if I read it. There were judges and surgeons. They could rot in hell as far as I was concerned. So that's where I went. I rotted. I went to rot in hell. I fell into a job at the controller's office. And I never even admitted I was there. All those ambitious, dynamic investment bankers to be, they were just passing through. And me, I wasn't even there. Office aid for 10 years. Why was I there? Well, this story begins long ago, and tonight it will be told. First of all, the whispered question city employees asked one another in those days was, how did you get the job? Or, more simply put, who did you know? Whom did I know? A man named Mead Esposito. Uh, he got me an office aid job at the New York City Controller's Office. Why? Because my grandmother, Margie, had a brother, Redzi, who was a fighter, and he became friends with me back when they were in their teen years. This is back in the teens of the 20th century. They were like brothers Mead and Red Z. All right, so my grandmother's father was a street cleaner. So what? Well, one day he died, felled by the modern age. While sweeping the gutters, he was struck down by one of them gas buggies, uh, which drove off as he crawled home to his wife and family. He died climbing up the stairs. After, I'm sure, some bereavement, my great-grandmother remarried. Her new husband was bringing his children from Italy, so she insisted that her son, Redzi the fighter, get a real job and show these foreigners that people in New York work for a living. So Redzi got a job with the TA. They were building the Lexington line, and the first day on the job, he's electrocuted. I mean, I hate stories like this. They're about victims. But these were the ones my grandmother told me. And still tells me today. It was only later I learned how inquiries and witnesses could lead to uh, explanations and justice of some kind. But my grandmother is not the inquisitive type, or if she is, she's, she's discreet. <laughs> anyway, Mead, best friends with Redzi, becomes best friends with Margie. And 50 years later, he is the Kings County Democratic leader. Every June, he offered my sister and I a summer job. Monica, remember? I, I worked as a mechanics. I, I worked like a, like a mechanics uh, shop. It was a boot camp where I used to repair lawnmowers or something. And then I got a job. Uh, I was picking up distribution sheets, food distribution sheets for Benet Brith. This is going to be. And then when I graduated, you know, by by the time I graduated from college, I got this permanent job as office aide 
Not only was I never unemployed, but I never looked for a job. But why should I? I was office aid. I acted upon complex commands like collate these sheets, copy this microfilm, enter these numbers. And there I was saying, this is not me. I'm a famous filmmaker developing my next project. It was a fabulous screenplay about underground filmmakers achieving fame and fortune and notoriety with these films that would eventually convict them of murder. It's called Storm Cloud, I think. Some people have been in the readings recently. This was around the time that John Kennedy Toole, John Kennedy Toole's mom, posthumously published his book, Confederacy of Dunces. Mr. Toole's main character was a Frankfurter salesman. He achieves salvation. Did you ever read it? He, he leaves his mom's home. It's a great book. And he, he joins his better half. And this is the woman he's meant for. Now, Mr. Toole himself commits suicide. Uh, and his mother then posthumously put, put out his book. I wrote Storm Cloud at the controller's office. And this is the song I wrote about working at the controller's office. see beyond my own deception. I was a little criminal. Masturbation was my first clandestine crime, and I did that every day. Tied, <coughs> tied though I am to the printed page, talking with you today represents a breakthrough in communication and enlightenment. People are listening and they're willing to remove blinders when, when they can find them. If you can just find these blinders, you can remove them. When we're on the fast track to discovery and compared with the old day, do you think things are really moving very fast today? Um, our decade is a former century, so we're very fortunate to be among the six billion uh, celebrating our self-designated millennium. We're, um, I'm happy to say, since I'm sorry that I wasn't born sooner, that uh, we're accelerating snowballing uh, at a multiples of like a hundred lifetimes. Uh, we think big, we're open. Let's say if God asks, we're ready to talk about the secret contents of the tree of knowledge. Everyone's extraordinary, we're going to throw a little extraordinary in the way of the world. 
uh, everyone's an industry, we're taking responsibility for our lives, and if we're not, we're aware enough to admit it. Ah, I fucked up. I can't look beyond my own navel, and I'm ready to move on. <laughs> well, I mean, these little aphorisms. Robert Priest is coming up soon. He has these great ones. Uh, my favorite is, uh, the most dangerous people are the obedient ones. So, uh, as for extraordinary, well, Seinfeld... <laughs> Seinfeld had a routine about extra strength. Do you remember that at all? Strength is no longer on the market. There's only extra strength for cold remedies. But when you're in real pain, you gotta get maximum strength. Give me, he says, give me the maximum allowable human dosage. Figure out what'll kill me and back it off. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's me because I'm more than ordinary. I'm more than just extraordinary. I'm maximum ordinary. <laughs> at present, I'm in the fortunate position of living with another. A uh, person, the beautiful faith, beautiful person I'm living with is faith Palmer person. Uh, I mean, our issues are arriving. We differ in our perception of the good life. You know, I think everybody knows what the good life is. It's like one thing, but we're actually managing to differ. In our, we're not enjoying each other's solitary activities, like doing something alone somehow is not something that a person likes to be seen doing. And I'm noticing that more and more as I play piano. Are you? Well. And then, then I get into this thing, well, you're never married, you know, well, that's a commitment, you know, we're committing all the time. I'm going to read a poem, uh, it's called The Four Comments, and it deals with the, the problems of being in a relationship where you start getting clingy and it becomes a, an enclosure rather than a, you know, an expanse of your experience. The Black Pit comment says, you made him lose control, he is my person, we're peopled. We both have been committed to the two of us, you basin. From basing your opinion on a person's reputation, avoid scandal. Thank you. I knew you'd understand. <laughs> Number two. The girls are so complacent here, they're lounging in their spaceships, looking down on private nurses, going down on older men. It's a pleasure with a purpose. It's pathetic how they lie around in physical duress. Uh, number three. Who said I knew love? The feeling is embraceable. I love people as possessions, so I also go without them. And then the fourth one, which is of course my main problem at the time that I wrote this. Bringing that boy over, making noises in the next room, that's cathartic what you did for me, the things you do, they're all for me. I know you don't intend they be, it's just you and what you do and when you go, I love that too. Um, there's um, a poem by Stephen Sondheim, actually it's, it's lyrics from Company. You're sorry, grateful, then she walks in, and still you're sorry, and still you're grateful, thinking of what might have been, then she walks out. Well, all right, I fucked up my life, so I'll have children. Maybe they'll be, make a better go of it. Now, to say, I love you, you love me? Yes. Is that it? Yes. Hold it right there, mister. You are guilty of violating one of the basic laws of sacred ambivalence. We summon you to the court of the Crimson King. <laughs> hey, what's the big deal? People are committing all the time. Not you. You have taken the vows of sacred ambivalence. I did? <laughs> I did that. Well, yes, you did, by your own volition, a long time ago. You took these vows. Um, well, what's my violation? Thou shalt not express a pure emotion without acknowledging the opposite. All right, I love you one day, I may hate you. Okay, now go back to the convent where you belong. Fuck, I should have been more discreet. So uh, I'm a little criminal. I should be discreet about it, don't tell me. Everything's okay. People are making millions committing to their intuition while I hem and haw and hedge. But there's an investment from, for me and my family, it's a family of hedge funds. This is my attempt at a joke, a hedge fund for people who can't commit. So what are the laws of sacred ambivalence? Well, thou shalt remain neutral at all times. Thou shalt not be subjective. Thou shalt be objective. Just look at the world, you know, from uh, get out of your goldfish bowl and look at the world from a distance. Thou shalt not, of course, commit to anything, because it's going to be the wrong choice. That couple's cursed in hell living with the wrong choice. Um, T.S. Eliot created a character in his play, Family Reunion, who I kind of related to. He had this devoted chauffeur who kept the car running while his mother was making plans for his life. Sure, why not? I could relate to that. <laughs> Thou shalt not allow damn breaks of emotion. Pretend you were responsible for making your own decisions, even though you had no choice in the matter. Then, of course, don't kill yourself, no matter how painful or glorious it is, because you're going to die anyway. <laughs> don't, don't let anyone see you sexually excited. Go home and, when well hidden, review erotica, you crotchety hermit. <laughs> Mom and Dad 
dad will take care of you, find you a job, find you a wife. <laughs> You know, I was very grateful for popular culture because it connects you with the world. That's true. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't concern myself with myself. This is a horrible thing. Since I was too impotent to concern myself with myself, impotence thanks to being oversexed. Gee, honey, why can't you get excited? You've only had three blowjobs in the last half hour. You completely lose your, your drives because I'm theorizing that it's possibly because of a sexual drive related to one's ambition. Um, I saw a lot of old friends last week at Jordan Fister's birthday party. I'm very happy to have seen them, but I, I figured, God, I really let them down, you know, because I became a lawyer, and all I ever talked about when I spoke with them was filmmaking. It's my only subject. Anyway, the term sacred ambivalence appeared in my novel Storm Cloud, the one that I wouldn't have written had I not worked at the control zones. <laughs> the, the filmmakers in Storm Cloud, they have all this. They have wealth, fame, acknowledgement, and love, and they face it all with sacred ambivalence. I do what I do, and you choose to notice it's fine. Now you're going overboard. Don't make too much of a big deal about me. I, you know, I'm very cool about my incredible accomplishments. It helps if you have these accomplishments. Sacred ambivalence is also my version of discretion. It's not that I don't care, but that I don't want anyone to know that I care. Don't notice me while I'm playing. You'll confuse me. Concentrate. I've got to concentrate with awareness. Don't notice me or you'll stop me. Yes, son, that is the most colossal waste of time. Hey, what is he doing? Just what is he doing trying to get in front of me? Now that I know his intention, I am going to thwart it. This is my driving situation. So I'm secret, don't tell me. I'm clandestine, even now. I mean, who knows we're here? Thank you all for being here. We're pulling one over on the news media. This is a secret performance. <laughs> there is another option. You can spend your time planning, compiling lists, calling people, schedule, then follow the schedule, and enroll people. Language like this comes from the world of landmark education. This is a self-help that this is a self-help center that teaches transformational technology. It was founded by a celebrated speaker, Werner Erhard. Landmark education is the next best thing to being in the land of Hallmark greeting cards. All my life, the figure of Werner Erhard loomed in the background. Does anybody know who I'm talking about here? Yeah. It's called Erhard Seminar Training, something like that, EST. My sister has much more experience with the past, though, how she managed to go without being very effective, I don't know. But it started, for me, I, I mean, there were boys in, in Malloy who would get, get, get enrolled by these heathen girlfriends, and then they'd come in late the next day because they were, they were out all night Sunday because uh, they were going to get, that they were, they were waiting until they got something, or something they had to get out of this. I, I hate to ask what it is. Well, there are, there are a lot of good things. They had to get, um, there were a lot of good things about it also. And um, one of the things, just an example is, like, I hate, to, I hate to be imposing, I hate to ask. You know, I don't want to make a nuisance of myself. So they, um, one of the ways you can look at that is you consider your, consider your request an opportunity. You know what I mean? Like, I, I will devote my time to creative projects that will both enlighten and delight. I produce plays, I perform once a week, I will perform once a week, I will write into the late hours, and I will create supportive relationships. And your, you know, your support, my asking you is an opportunity for you to contribute to me, or you can also show that you want to withhold your contribution. So it's simply the idea of find, uh, asking people to you know, contribute to you. That's one way of looking at it. Anyway, cleaning up my little mess is going to uncover the very big mess that I can't even begin to understand until I get through all this. Um, everything is solved, then real problems arise, like what do we do tomorrow, and how do we, you know, make a good home for our family, and how do we, you know, how, how, it's, it's talking about looking into the future, rather than, you know, sweeping out the past, get rid of it. Well, my favorite, okay, the, uh, the other things I have to offer here are just a few minor things, then I'll play a few songs if I may. The, my favorite recent spoken word album is called Equemini, it's by Outkast, and, um, also, I want to make reference to The Hills Are Alive again. I'm going back to Broadway. You know, Sound of Music is back. Oscar Hammerstein wrote the words to it, but the fame... You know, the show that's currently on Broadway has these beautiful lyrics from the movie version. They say, strength doesn't lie in numbers. Strength doesn't lie in a well. Strength lies in nights of peaceful slumber. When you wake up, wake up! That's a beautiful line to me. Uh, 
Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It's a song called I Have Confidence in Sunshine. It was such a beautiful thing, actually, remembering. Um, uh, my shock today is that the credits on the album give the words to Richard Rogers, because Oscar Hammerstein had died by that time. So Richard Rogers actually wrote these uh, uh, few lyrics. For those of you who think highly of it, I, I think very highly of it. The Richard Rogers' music has been a tremendous influence on my life. Anyway, the, the S&M of the Sound of Music is that I remember I, I remember making love to a woman whose limbs I had tied to the bedpost at her request during a Good Friday broadcast of Sound of Music on TV. All right. And this is at a farm and food resort in Pennsylvania. Believe me, this is very outside the ordinary days of my activity. And you know, I still love her. I, I love her for what she was. I mean, she loves me for what I was. It was like a slave treatment thing. The goddess demands sex on command. She loves men to enslave her. She the slave, but it must be friends who tie her. Anyway, that's it. Sacred Ambivalence. Sacred Ambivalence has been brought to you by General Mills, makers of Fine Oat Cereals. This has been Bill Todson bringing you a Mark Goodson, Monty Hall production. All right. Let's see what the Peter deserves. Peter's going to do some songs for us on the piano. I'm going to come around with the tip jar now. That's what we're going to pay him this evening. So please be very generous and stick around. We've got lots of great stuff coming up for you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, if you want to encourage a continuation of this, please do. Okay, uh, thank you very much for coming out. And for, um, I'm going to play the, the two new songs that I think I know a little better now. One is called Come Out, Come Out. Come out and tell me when you know it's time to go. I think we've had it. It's a show. I can't go in there. I no longer even want to For you, I let it go For you and I were meant to be But that was long ago Pattern papers, rings of light Ceramic tiles and paint The wind increased from four to eight The windows wide but quaint we launch a ship on an ocean blue, avoid our liquid floor. We float, we hover, we tread the air, we drink, we fight no more. I pour my guts, I gather more, I push my guts, I'm free. The more I see, the more I lose, I'm drunk with what I see. For you and I, from long ago, are ever meant to be. Embrace us as we walk across a field. Their patterns shape us, so we yield. With decoration, we can even make a home here. We're here, from here we go. For you and I were meant to be, but that was long ago. Or then I have to know it before I go I'm seeing you again Come out from out of the garden fence Take heed and vent on me I'm yours for comfort, I'm yours to smite Come out and set me free For I am only a lonely one Entrapped inside a tree The more I seek, the more I lose I'm stuck from being me and you and I from long ago are ever meant to be. For I am only a lonely one entrapped inside a tree. The more I seek, the more I lose. I'm drunk from being me. And you and I from long ago are ever Gated house and garden. In the morning, covers gently stirring, eyes and nose, then mouth wide open. Lies a woman 
woman soft and purring And she's on her last adventure Her signals loud and clear Our hair is standing straight up At last she has her Nobody's going to wake up What did she say? And when she calls us near Nobody's going to wake up And we love her She's a gift of nature So we're on our best behavior We become her We the great pretenders And she's lying on her back now Her room in a convent kept her safe from all the wild men At last we have her in our gated house and garden What shall we do with the beautiful lass? Let's take her to the garden where we'll roll her in the grass What shall we say when she wants to run away? Let's show her how we need her and we want her so to stay right. It's the steam that rises from her Drops to wilt your wingspan You become her She's the great provider And you're on your best behavior Out of the convent She embraces all the wild men At last we have her In our gated house and garden poems while he's setting up from Dave the Poet. Let's hear it one more time for Peter Zotai. Yeah. 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 